Hi everybody, my name is Scott Walls. For over 25 years, I've deployed ERP applications for some of the world's largest organizations. During that time, I've taught thousands of people just like you how to discover, use, deploy, and support Oracle's back office applications. In this lesson, I'm going to teach you what a procurement contract is, types and examples, when they're created, how they're created, and by whom, as well as how contract lines relate to agreements. Please note that this lesson is part of the Procurement or Supplier Contracts course found under the Contract Management area of the Discover menus. But before we get started, did you know that you could earn free discovery badges for display on your LinkedIn profile just by watching videos like this one? You can. Stay until the end of this video and I'll show you how. Okay, so let's get started. Key topics for this lesson are as follows. What are procurement contracts? Procurement contract types and examples. When are contracts created? How are contracts created? Who creates procurement contracts? Contracts parties. Contract metadata. Contract to spend linkage. And finally, contract substatuses and management. First topic, what are supplier or procurement contracts? Contracts are negotiated documents ensuring compliance with the terms and conditions of an agreement between parties. Contract management is the process of systematically and efficiently managing contract creation, execution, and analysis for the purpose of maximizing financial and operation performance as well as minimizing risk. Second topic, contract types and examples. So first types, these are not necessarily delivered values or specific types, but I find, or we find all contracts within a procurement application. So supplier contracts tend to fall into one of three types, non-financial, such as a non-disclosure, joint venture, teaming agreements what we call pre-purchase contracts. So those are buyer supplier contracts and they're around a financial transaction, but they really encompass all financial transactions. They can also be refer referred to as master contracts. So master of professional services, master of services, master of hosting, master of end user license agreements or what they call ULAs. So those are different pre-purchase contracts. And then there are actual purchase contracts. So that's for a particular instance. Oftentimes, the last two contracts have what's called hierarchy, meaning that the first contract lays out base terms and conditions, and they may be overwritten at the purchase contract level. Next, the contract type. That's actually a specific field within Fusion. That field allows for contracts to control roles that are involved expiration, risk evaluation, signature or e-signature behaviors, who the parties are or may be, what the output, so does that contract output in a agreement with lines, a regular agreement, etc., notifications, and much more. Then finally, it's worth noting that there's really two types of authoring, internally authored and externally authored. So internally authored just means somebody in our organization has authored the contract. They've pulled the terms, they've edited those terms, going back and forth with the supplier. They've done the authoring process inside Fusion. It is possible for something to be externally authored. That's often referred to as supplier paper, but truthfully, depending on how you configure, you could actually have a contract pulled in a word template authored internally with our crew in procurement sent out to the supplier and then uploaded into the contract record. Okay, so three, when are contracts created? So you can see our old uh, procurement cloud diagram here where we have purchasing service and sourcing services. So really when you're purchasing, particularly self-service, you're probably using a contract and that's related to an agreement. It's only when you don't have a catalog driven content or pre-negotiated content that you now are probably going to go out and invoke or author contracts. Topic number four, how are contracts created? So there's really five different ways. You can create structured contracts. And so those are where you have the terms and the clauses and they're all broken down inside of Fusion. They may be related to risk, etc. You could do contracts or author contracts, what we call simplified. 
which I would include supplier paper from a technical perspective, they're both similar, meaning that when you author a contract that is simplified or supplier paper, like the example I gave earlier, even an internally authored contract, Fusion doesn't understand the different lines or clauses. It just sees an object for a contract. You can use the contract wizard. You can author a contract from negotiations, which is really nice. You can go finish your negotiation, but before you award it, you can actually get through the contracting phase, making sure you don't have any egg on your face if you can't get the contract authored. And then finally, you can interface contracts from third-party applications. Next up, who is creating these procurement contracts? Well, it could be category managers, buyers, could be suppliers, they participate in all of the self-service redlining of contracts, could also be contract administrators. So those are embedded legal folks inside procurement, and they often decide whether to make the call out to legal or risk or what they'll call internal or other people review. And then finally, signers. So next, procurement contract parties. So who's involved in this? Well, really, there's four main types of contract parties, customer, primary legal, additional legal entities, and supplier. Next up, contract metadata. Here's where cloud really begins to separate itself from legacy contracts, whether it's EBS or PeopleSoft. You really see that there is the contract document itself. You can go through author terms, etc. But there's two big areas, and one of them is this idea of metadata. So what I highlighted across the top are these different links, and so it's just metadata to attach to this contract. It's also nice because some of this metadata, in a fulfillment sense, links the contract paper document, which has been authored here, to the construct of a contract, an agreement, or a PO inside the application. So now you have the ability to do what's called rolling spend, up against your contract lines or contract. So that is what I lump into metadata, but it's excellent functionality. Also, it's worth noting that the DocuSign integration is simply the best in the industry. I don't get paid by DocuSign, but quite frankly, it's one of the best and easiest integrations I've ever seen in 25 years of deploying and integrating applications. Next, contract spend linkage. There is a definite way to implement definite do's and don'ts in regards to the flow of contracts, when to use sourcing, how to create agreements, whether or not to use contract lines to create purchase orders. And if you do, what problem does that create? Remember, because you can doesn't always mean you should. That's as of Q3 2021. Ninth topic, sub statuses and reporting. This is another area of contracts that I love. This is relatively new. This is the biggest recent advancement, I'd say, in contract applications. Sub statuses allow you to not only define user statuses between draft, so I'm just starting the contract, and active. For those of you that don't have contracts, just starting is like you're going to the share drive and pulling the word template. All right, so there's this whole idea of, of right sizing the contract, sending it to the supplier, the back and forth of the redlining to get it back, to get it approved, to get it created into, let's say, an agreement. It is a big process, not to mention getting it out to signature. And so what sub statuses do is they allow you to break these steps into small groups and they allow you to assign a contract to groups and they allow someone to see and manage that workload. You can see some of the statuses here on the slide. So buyer's author, supplier's red line, contract admin's review, legal reviews, signer reviews. And so this is a great way to quantify the steps and then for management to be able to manage all the contracts that are being worked on and what steps they happen to be. In. Okay, so you should now be able to understand the what, when, how, and who related to contracts and authoring, creation, etc. You should understand some types and examples. You should understand the parties, the metadata, a little bit more than the metadata, the linkage, and this idea of sub statuses. So that's the end of this presentation, but hopefully just the start of your learning journey. There are thousands of free videos just like this one. Remember, better content, better skills, better income, better life. We wanna help you get 1% better every day. Thank you for watching and have a great day.
Okay, as promised, here are the five steps you can perform today to start earning free badges for your LinkedIn profile. Step one, navigate to panamir.com and either sign in or join now, it's free. Step two, in the upper left, under the Discover menu, select the course that you want to watch and get badged for. Step three, watch all of the different video lessons in that course. Step four, when it's complete, send your LinkedIn profile and the course you watched and your user ID to badges at panamir.com. And then sit back and wait for step five when we attach a badge to your LinkedIn profile.